The Trades Union Congress said it will not compromise on ensuring the rights of its members. Speaking to Joy Business, Secretary General of the Union, Dr. Yaba, indicated that his outfit will work to ensure that justice is served the 60 workers laid off by Sunan Asogli Power Limited. Well, we live in this country, we have a constitution. The constitution allows every Ghanaian, whether you are a manager or uh, an ordinary worker, to form a union or to join a union, whether you are in the private sector or, or public sector, or even in the informal sector. We have informal sector unions. Mm. So whoever is saying that a private sector company workers cannot form union, it's totally wrong. The constitution gives us that right, and that right can never be compromised. We, we, we do know that come 8th of March, you will be meeting with them. What are we to expect? Are we likely to see an amicable solution being reached at the end of the day? That's all we all hope for. I am very confident. And as Mumi said, the Minister for Employment uh, was very swift in his reaction to this. And he sent a high-powered delegation to Tema yesterday, and I'm sure with all these efforts, when we meet on the 8th, we should be able to have an amicable solution. Uh, we are also doing uh, background things to make sure that this doesn't, you know. At the end of the day, we are talking about the rights of workers uh, within the constitution of Ghana, within the labor laws, to join or form a union, and nobody can stop them. Mm. Nobody, nobody can stop them. Not even the president of Ghana can stop workers from forming a union or joining the union. It is our, our right, and that right we want to exercise. So nobody should play with that right. And okay. we expect everybody to work with us to ensure that Ghanaian workers, you know, especially those who are working under foreign hands, are able to exercise their rights as Ghanaians. This is very, very important, and we are not going to compromise on that. Now, energy strategist Dr. Yusuf Suleimana is urging government to re-strategize and review regulations in the upstream petroleum sector to attract investments. His comments come following a warning from oil exploration firms that the current regulatory environment threatens fresh investments and could push some firms out of business. He spoke earlier on Business Live. Squarely, you can't put the blame entirely on government mm. at the end of the day. But what I'm saying is that, of course, what I just paint is the global challenges that I talked about. So, and government, governments or governments of the global space, they don't have much control over that, you know. So it's left for the local government or governments of individual countries to create that enabling environment to be able to attract investment. Right now, if you, if you observe what, 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 what's going on, there's a, a bit of competition, and that competition is real. We cannot hide from it. Competition into the investment to the world of hydrocarbon and competition to the investment into the world of renewables. That is a fact. Now, what renewable energy lacks now is the ability to be able to have access to any global energy security. And when I talk about global energy security, I'm talking about energy affordability, mm -hmm. energy dependability, and energy availability. These things, the renewables are not yet able to do that. If you look at the power sector in terms of solar and, and the rest, some areas renewables are okay. In fact, they are far, far more competitive than the mainstream hydrocarbon or the conventional hydrocarbon. But we are not talking about that bias. We are talking about energy that can drive industrialization. It's not there. Renewable cannot do that, as we speak now. So to balance that, we need to be able to create a enabling environment so that those we have, we have to ensure that they are able to maximize their investment portfolio within our field. That's very important. Mm. This field, bear in mind, after a decade, they run out. I mean, they will come depleted. And if they become depleted and we don't replenish by fresh investment, I mean, we, we're not going to have it good. Uh, by now, we should have more than 200,000 barrels of oil production per stream day. But now, we, we, uh, as we speak now, we are only doing 145, 140 to 145 after 10 years. That's quite unfortunate. And we need to re-strategize to be able to bring in fresh investment. The Ghana city has strengthened in value by almost 3% to the U.S. dollar this week. This is coming after it depreciated by nearly 2% last week. The local currency is now going for 12 cities, 60 pesos to one American greenback in the retail or forex market. It also gained some value against the pound and euro, respectively. Checks by Joy Business at some Forest Bureau indicate that the city's recovery began midweek with some analysts attributing it to improve dollar supply. Again, the suspension of external debt service appears to have eased the pressure 
on foreign exchange supply as the country is no longer serving most of its external debt. Meanwhile, the year-to-date loss of the city to the dollar is about 18%. Moving on, Group Director of Capacity Development at African Guarantee Fund, Patrick Lumumba, has underscored the need to support banks in cushioning the operations of women in small businesses. According to him, there's a need for a favorable policy implemented by government to create an enabling environment for women to lead in business. Speaking to Joy Business, he called for more public-private partnerships within the financial sector. Without uh, disaggregation on gender, then it's very difficult to have data to make any decision. So it's a very good step. But more still needs to be done. More needs to be done in terms of uh, enabling the financial institutions in terms of lesser provisioning, probably, so that financial institutions can be aggressive in accessing financing to women-led SMEs. Um, uh, on a broad level, the government itself needs to come up with policies and programs that can uh, enable um, uh, more women-led SMEs to come to the fore. Because uh, what some of the challenges that uh, commercial banks have is that they indicate that uh, there are no women-led SMEs that they can lend to. So policy environment needs to change so that it's more gender sensitive, gender positive, so that uh, more and more women-led SMEs can come to the fore. Um, uh, having public-private initiatives. Soya bean is one of the most valuable leguminous plants or crops cultivated both in developed and developing economies. In Ghana, the cultivation of soya bean is relatively new. However, its economic importance is gaining wider popularity and common acceptance among farmers in the country, especially those in the northern parts of Ghana. Today on Food Chain, Emma Davis engages value chain actors at WA in the Upper West region. Saido Abdullahi Usman is a young man who has been in the soya value chain business since he turned 15. He holds a bachelor degree in biotechnology and molecular biology, but Saido prefers to work with his uncle, who is an off taker. Saido shares how soya bean is farmed. So, what normally happens is that they do their plowing and they're sowing somewhere in June. Later by June, July, you are done. Because if you delay, then the rains stop. It's going to be a challenge. So after planting, you wait three months, then your soya will be ready for harvesting. You see, at this particular point, we are not seeing soya because you make a mistake and leave soya to dry so much. By the time you get into your fault, everything has shattered onto the ground. You have to use a broom to sweep it around, which is not possible. So basically, we do the planting, we wait for it to mature. But as that goes on, agronomic activities are going on. Uh, applying fertilizer, then controlling weeds, and all that. After soya is harvested, the aggregator moves the crop to a warehouse. Production manager for Antica Company Limited, Musa Lukman, explains what happens at a typical warehouse. Yeah, this is after production. We bring it to the warehouse okay. for storage and almost process to get your seed. Okay, so what exactly goes on at the warehouse? At the warehouse, what happens is that we support farmers to produce the soybeans with the foundation seed. So after the production, then we bring it like this, raw like this. Mm -hmm. Then we put it and then process it. We bring women here, they will come and do the, take off the child, the debris, the broken ones. After which we then package it into the certified seed uh, bags. Okay. Then we almost package it into kilos, like one kilo, five kilo, nine kilo, there about then. We then give it out to the farmers. Last year we were having it on the subsidy. Okay. The price was, uh, a kilo was eight cities last year. So as we go this year, they have to go again. The government will come out with another subsidy price, then we go buy it. When the subsidy price is set, you cannot sell above that or even below that. To ensure that good yields are achieved along the soya value chain, soya seed farmers need to be registered and certified. Musa describes what cuts for a good soya seed. 
The certification process starts from the production. Okay. Before you can become a, a seed grower, okay. you have to be registered. Okay. So all Antica seed growers have been registered under Antica, okay. under one umbrella. So after which then the seed inspectors will then you take them to the farms, the various locations, the farm, the, even we give them their details. Okay. Then they will do their certification. In there they will go, they, we have about five types of uh, soybean varieties. We have the Afayag, Jonguma, Kwashi, uh, Favor, there are many. So if you are doing Favor, the inspector will go to the farm. He's, he has the characteristics and the look of Favor. So the inspector will go, if he sees any other variety like Jonguma in the midst of Favor, then he has to remove it. At, at a testing threshold, you have to disqualify the fault. When all is done on the farm and at the warehouse, the produce is sold to processors. In Ghana, soya is only processed into oil and animal feed. One of the popular soya processors in WA is Vision Farms. Alhassan Bafara Ibrahim is the chief executive. When we bring the raw material, that's the, the beans, the soya beans. We normally pack them here, we don't pack them on the ground. From there, we measure about 100 kilograms. Okay. Inside this drum, it's a drum. Mm. We only use this one to cover the drum so that the, the, the smoke will not be inside the factory to flow out of the chimney. Okay. Uh -huh. So we put about 100 kilograms inside this drum. Then this will toast it or will fry it or roast it for about 20 to 25 minutes to a temperature of 88 degrees Celsius. Okay, how do you check your temperature? Yeah, we have a thermometer and then we have the physical testing too. This is how the rings are. So these ones are the presses. They will press and squeeze the oil out of the uh, bean. Then the oil will flow here and then the cake will run out. When we get the crude, just as I said, we do some refining over there. Then when we do the refinery, we actually don't have a system where it can transport the oil inside this. Okay. So we rather pick the oil inside this. We have a filter inside. Then it will filter the oil. These are not taps. They are oil taps. So it passes through here. Inside the taps. The taps. Then we'll bottle. That's it for Ghana Soya Value Chain. For Joy Business, Emma Davis. Now catch the full episode of this on Saturday at 6 p.m. right here on this channel. Now the Chamber of Aquaculture has called for improved policy and deepened collaboration between the Ministry of Agriculture and the Fisheries and Aquaculture Development Ministry. According to the Chamber CEO Jacob Azikas, research arms of the various ministries should be able to find raw materials which could serve as alternatives to fish feed. The call comes after fish farmers complained of the hike in feed. He's been speaking with my colleague Isaac Atase on Joy Business. Well, unfortunately for us, we just don't have the alternative because we, are, we already we are producing the feed locally. The, the, I think for, for the short term, especially with the coming um, um, planting season, the two ministries should, should make conscious effort to link the activities together. So the farmers under the Ministry of Food and Agriculture to understand that, to understand, understand the demand of the, uh, the fisheries and aquaculture development mm -hmm. in terms of um, um, fish feed raw materials. To understand the volume that we, we need and the quality that we expect. So for example, if it's about issue about moisture content, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the Ministry of uh, Food and Agriculture should be able to invest into this equipment or Ghana Commodity Exchange to be able to invest into equipment, equipment that can dry the, the, the maize, for example, which we use as our carbohydrate ingredients to the, the, the standard that fish feed producers want. Then also we need to start um, investing into research. At the moment, one of the main sources of carbohydrate for um, fish feed ingredients is maize. We have other um, materials, raw materials around that we can look into. For example, cassava. Is it that cassava chips could be the alternative for 
the carbohydrate ingredient. I mean, we should be looking into that as well. So we have to start researching into alternative fish feed ingredients, especially for carbohydrates and for protein. So by this, we're going to have at least some guaranteed quality. So issue about maybe a farmer supplying a particular volume that after you do your test and the rest, you have to bring the, the, quality, the quantity reduces because of right. quality issue can be eliminated within the shortest possible time. An industry research and development hub, Fresh Pact, created by Blue Skies, held a stakeholder discussion to find solutions to the numerous economic impacts of plastic waste on Ghana and the economy. According to Dr. Ebenezer Lai, a researcher and senior lecturer at the University of Northampton, there's a need for more investments into countering the many effects of plastic waste on the country's human resource. Blue Skies, in collaboration with Fresh Packed Development Hub, organized a stakeholder meeting on how to resolve challenges posed by plastic waste in Ghana. Participants of Fresh Packed were tasked to come out with project plans to facilitate the commercialization of the solutions. Speaking in an interview, a researcher at Fresh Packed, Dr. Ebenezer Lai said, plastic waste is a growing cause of flooding. So we know that there's peri uh, perennial flooding, uh, especially in Accra, um, every, uh, every year. Uh, there was a study done recently which looked at the cumulative loss of, um, uh, in terms of the economic impact. Right? So cumulatively, uh, we're not just looking at, of course, uh, uh, property damage. Uh, but we're looking at um, the cost of any health implications from the flooding, um, any losses of life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when you put all of that together cumulatively, um, the figure that uh, that study came to was a hundred million dollars, which is a cumulative uh, figure of what we lose every year um, because of flooding. And this is important uh, or related to the plastics issue. Because, of course, everybody in this country knows that a huge part of the problem when it comes to flooding is the inability of our drains to carry water, um, rainwater, all the way through uh, to the oceans. And that is mainly in part because the plastics are choking our gutters, makes it very, very difficult for, for them to drain properly. Um, and so, of course, if we are able to address the plastic challenge, I think we would have done a lot to address that perennial flooding problem in Accra and minimize the economic impact. Research scientists at the Center for Scientific Research, Portia Adade Williams, urge governments and stakeholders to support small and medium sized enterprises making efforts to find solutions to the menace. One thing governments can do more is creating that enabling environment for the SMEs. Do we have a business model as a country for plastic? And how can we bring the private sector more on board? If they want to set up businesses, how can we create that enabling environment? How can we lose in some of these things for these SMEs to also come on board? And when you talk about the SMEs, we have the Waste Pickers Association, those who do it on more small scale. We have those who are into the recycling and all that. And I think those are very key. And um, when you talk about where I'm coming from to, then we are talking about the R&D. We have a number of projects that we are enrolling, but it's always more on the pilot um, scale. So we can have the private sector now come on board to collaborate with us. And that is one thing Blue Skies does very well. And so we come and collaborate on that to, to make sure that we can now have it more on a larger scale. Most of these, we have a, a project on converting waste to energy, and that is more on municipal solid waste which contains plastic. Plastics have become a dominant component in the country's terrestrial and marine ecosystems. The Ghana Water Initiative, a strategic business unit within Grand Force, has launched its shore water mineral water to increase water affordability in other parts of the country. According to its engagement manager, Holali Kodo, the new packaged water is aimed at increasing water security and to aid in contributing to a more sustainable environment by reducing the use of sachi water in Ghana. He spoke to Joy Business at the launch of its shore water mineral water in Insawam in the eastern region. Shore water will provide access to clean water as a refill service to 4,000 residents in Otwase and 150,000 residents in Insawam as well as citizens from other parts of Accra. 
according to Engagement Officer for the Ghana Water Initiative, Olali Yao Kumakbodo. This is part of the larger project which aims to develop commercially viable solutions to provide water services to undeserved communities in Ghana and reach 1 million people with drinking water by 2026. In 2019, uh, Grandforce, as the biggest pump manufacturing company uh, in the world, decided to take some more responsibilities in SDG 6 uh, to get water to people who do not currently have. Uh, when you look at our system now, uh, Ghana Water, for example, takes care of the urban centers, the community water sanitation, and the, I think the NGOs take care of like very small communities. But if you look at small towns, where we call them the middle, no one is really taking care of them. Uh, so we decided to take that responsibility upon ourselves and make sure that everyone has access to water. Uh, because when you look at the SDGs, we are driven by the SDG 6, right? So when you look at the SDG 6, which stipulate that everybody needs to have uh, water uh, and sanitation and that is currently not the case and as a pump company uh, our products are used in solving these um, water issues and we've just decided to take some more responsibility to see how best we can impact the world and going into that space uh, directly also he also mentioned that his outfit is committed to improving people's quality of life through access to clean water, which they believe is a fundamental right. Uh, so what we've uh, decided to do is to um, treat water for homes, so for equitaps or the stamp pipes as we normally call them. And we notice that infrastructurally um, we will not be able to pipe water to everyone's home. In Ghana or Africa, for example, we are not there yet uh, infrastructurally, but we don't want to leave anyone to behind. So we decided to come by this 20-liter uh, dispenser bottle after a lot of work. We know this is not going to um, make the environment bad or it's not going to pollute the environment uh, like we see with the sachet and the small bottles. So we decided to go into this space and so this will be able to crop subsidize the water we are uh, giving to the rural communities. Uh, we have decided to share through this in communities where normally they will not have uh, money to pay. So this bottle will be crop subsidizing what we are doing here for the homes, uh, for the equitabs, so that the business can be sustainable. Grand Force established the Ghana Water Initiative under the Grand Force Safe Water Unit to design and test new approaches to water service delivery in rural communities in Ghana. The company is working towards Grand Force's ambition of reaching 300 million people in 2030 with access to drinking water. Time now for your stock market update with Head of Republic Securities, Patrick Edem Agama. On the stock market this week, we saw activities in 22 equities. Total volumes traded decreased significantly by 81% week on week to about 441,000 shares. Values traded, however, saw a significant rise by 216% to about 14.3 million Ghana cities. And this was largely on the back of New Gold ETF. The composite index plunged into negatives to close the week at a year to date of negative 2.34%. The financial stock index also lost greatly to close the week at a year-to-date of negative 8.12% on the back of three laggards. The market recorded nine movers and shakers this week. Unilever led the gainers, gaining 51 pesos to close at 2.99 Ghana cities per share. Total gained 43 pesos to close at 5 Ghana cities per share. MTN followed closely, gaining a peso to close at 93 pesos per share. Ecobank Ghana led the losers, losing 18.67 in value to close at 5.4 Ghana cities per share. Farmark lost 13.04% to close at 1.8 Ghana cities per share. EGL and Standard Chartered Bank lost some pesos to close at 3 cities and 19 CDs respectively. Goyal lost 3 pesos to close at 1 CD, 65 pesos per share, and New Gold ETF lost some CDs to close at 229 Ghana CDs per share. And that's how we wrap up Prime Business. I'm Amisi Thompson. Thanks for your company. Up next is International Business.